uh, turn again to that passage in Acts chapter 2. As has been mentioned, today is Pentecost Sunday. For those who follow the church calendar, which we usually don't, apart from uh, the obvious at Christmas and Easter. But today, I think it's helpful for us to, to take a break from our uh, usual series and to consider Pentecost, to consider the events of Pentecost and what it means, what took place and what it means for us today. And to do that with this question in mind, what is the message at the heart of Pentecost? What is Pentecost primarily about? As we read this account, uh, what perhaps jumps out to us first is the miraculous happenings that take place uh, amongst the apostles on this day. The miraculous events, we can't help but notice them straight away as we start reading the account of what took place on Pentecost. It's there straight away in the first four verses of Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. The disciples of Jesus are gathered together on Pentecost. Pentecost is the Feast of Weeks. It's connected to the harvest and is also connected to the Ten Commandments being given to Moses and to the people of Israel on Mount Sinai. It's called Pentecost because it came 50 days after the Passover. And the disciples are together on this occasion. And as they're there together, something miraculous happens. They see these uh, tongues of fire, these flames of fire coming down. They hear this violent wind that um, fills the house that they're in. And this is, of course, an amazing event. If we imagine ourselves in their shoes for just a moment, this was something which was surely baffling, exciting, overwhelming, frightening even, as it initially happened to them. Yet it's crucial that on the one hand, we don't just think, cool, this is a miraculous event that happened to the disciples of Jesus, but rather that we understand what it signifies, that we understand what these uh, miraculous happenings are pointing to. The feast the disciples were gathered on was for the harvest and for the giving of the Ten Commandments. When the Ten Commandments were given in Exodus 19 and 20, that was accompanied with miraculous signs from heaven, wasn't it? In particular, we're told in Exodus 19, verses 16 and 18, that there was thunder and lightning and thick clouds on the mountain that day. We're told that on that occasion, the mountain was covered in smoke because the Lord descended onto the mountain in fire. Smoke and fire are significant as visible signs of the attending presence of the Lord. We see that in the Old Testament and particularly in the book of Exodus. From chapter 3, when Moses see, sees the burning bush, is there on the holy ground in the presence of the Lord. We see it there, right through to the flight from Egypt and the wilderness wanderings, where the pillar of fire and of smoke represent the presence of the Lord, or rather contain the presence of the Lord as he attends with his people, leading them out of slavery in Egypt, redeeming them from that. And so as we turn to Acts chapter 2, we should not just focus on the wind and the fire themselves, but see what they are representing to us, what they are signing and signifying for us. They point to the spiritual reality that is happening behind those miraculous events. As the wind fills the house, as the fire descends, something is going on underneath that um, from a spiritual point of view. And there's, of course, a connection in the Old Testament between wind and breath and spirit, with the same word being used to speak of them. And we see that carried over, don't we, in the New Testament, in places such as John chapter 3, where Jesus talks to Nicodemus. And then also here, we're told that there's a violent and rushing wind that fills the house. In verse 2, we see that there. And then the Holy Spirit fills the disciples themselves. The wind and the tongues of fire themselves are not what is important, but the spiritual reality which underlies them. 
Those things happen so that the disciples would be in no doubt as to what is happening on that occasion. That they'd be in no doubt that the promised Holy Spirit has now come and come upon them. The point is that the Lord has come to dwell again with his people. Again, we're told that it filled the whole house, verse 2. And that language there, too, is, is language that speaks of the coming of the special presence of God. And we have to talk about the special presence of God to distinguish that from his omnipresence. Because we know, of course, that God is everywhere and in all things. But when we talk about the presence of God coming, like in this passage, we're talking about the presence of God in a special and unique way. God's special presence descended and covered the mountain in Exodus chapter 19. Then later in Exodus chapter 40, the Lord's presence descends and covers the tent of meeting. We're told that his glory filled the tabernacle. Later on in the Old Testament, in 1 Kings chapter 8, we're told how the Lord's presence filled Solomon's temple. Now the Lord's presence, or more precisely, the Holy Spirit fills the house here at Pentecost. And one thing which is significant here is the similarities which we're seeing, but also the huge difference between those events and the account in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament accounts, the Lord's visible presence came to his people, but there were still levels of separation between the Lord's presence and his people. In fact, in Exodus chapter 19, the people were warned not to even approach the mountain. They were warned not to touch the mountain or they would die. In the case of the tabernacle and later the temple, the people were separated from the Lord's presence via mediation, via Moses' mediation, via the priesthood, via the ceremonial system of sacrifices. As for the wider world beyond the nation of Israel, the degree of separation was even further. It was Israel who were God's chosen people, with them that he dwelt. And yet now, here at Pentecost, the Lord's Holy Spirit, the Lord himself, fills the house where the disciples are gathered. And even beyond that, the Lord has not just come to dwell with his people, but in his people. We read that in verse 4, don't we? In verse 2, the house was filled. Then verse 4, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Not just the house was filled. It wasn't just with the people, but God, the Holy Spirit, dwelt in his people. And that led them to speak in the tongues of other nations, nations that were previously further removed from the Lord. And so this begs the question, well, how did these things happen? How can these things happen? Again, let's remind ourselves, Pentecost is not so much about the miraculous signs themselves, but the spiritual realities that those signs point to. And the spiritual reality is namely this, salvation and reconciliation with God open to all people without exception through the Lord Jesus, resulting in protection from judgment and the presence of God with and in his people. This is what Pentecost means. This is how the Lord can dwell with and in his people. And this is the exact message that we see in Peter's Pentecost sermon. It was not just the disciples of Jesus who were gathered together uh, at Pentecost. This was one of the pilgrimage festivals. And so we see in verse 5, there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. The disciples, following these dramatic events and the filling of the Holy Spirit, spill out into the streets and a crowd is drawn by the commotion of what has happened. They come across the disciples who have been filled with the Holy Spirit and they hear these Galileans speaking in their native tongues, they who come from many different regions. And we have this extensive list of all the places where these people have come from. And if you were to go and look at an old map, you'd find that these people come from 365 degrees around Jerusalem and have all come here to Jerusalem. And they come across the disciples and they hear them speaking their own languages and of course, they wonder what on earth is going on. Verse 12, amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? And some of them have, verse 13, their own answer to that question. They have had too much wine. And in response to this questioning, Peter preaches a famous sermon, surely one of the best sermons, one of the most fruitful sermons in history. 
And Peter begins by correcting their misapprehension of drunkenness. It's hard to see how people could think that the disciples speaking in foreign tongues were drunk. Alcohol tends to make people incoherent rather than miraculously coherent in their non-native tongue. Perhaps it meant that those who believed that they could hear the Galileans speaking in their own languages must have been drunk to believe that. Perhaps they assumed that the languages that they didn't understand were simply drunken babble. Either way, Peter corrects them. Peter, under God, clearly recognizes that something special, something unique, something that was promised in the Old Testament and to the disciples directly by Jesus is what has happened here. Peter begins by saying that what has taken place on this day is the fulfillment of what is promised in Joel chapter 2. Peter quotes from Joel chapter 2 in verses 16 to 21. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Peter says, this day and the miraculous signs that they and the people have seen that very day are the things that were promised by the Lord through the prophet Joel. He's telling them that the last days that the prophet Joel spoke about have come, where God would pour out his spirit on his people, where that would be marked by those miraculous signs by fire and smoke. These last days, Joel and Peter say, are the days which precede, which are the precursor to the great and glorious day of the Lord. The day of the spirit being poured out is the the last days, the days before God's judgment comes. The day before God's final judgment of all creation takes place. But as Peter says, before that judgment day, the last days are days of hope. As he says, where all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, for those listening to Peter's sermon, this surely would have seemed at this point like good news to them. We're told in verse 5 of Acts chapter 2 that the people there in Jerusalem were God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven, who had gathered together for the festival. News that that promised day of the Lord was coming and that his spirit had been poured out on his people. That would have been exciting. That would have been good news for them if it were true. They would have been excited by this kind of news. But immediately after that quotation from Joel, Peter throws a curveball to them by saying that Jesus is the key to all of this that Jesus is the key to what has happened on this day. Verse 22, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him. As you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. But God raised him up from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. It immediately becomes clear to the people that this might be less good news for them than they originally thought. The Holy Spirit now poured out on that day, first rested on the Lord Jesus from his baptism. And as Peter says, it was expressed through the signs and wonders and miracles that Jesus did, that they themselves knew about, Peter says. Peter later in his sermon will leave them in no doubt that it is the risen and ascended Lord Jesus who has been entrusted with the Holy Spirit, who has poured out the Holy Spirit now on his people. Peter explains that Jesus was handed over by God to wicked and to sinful men to be killed on the cross. It was part of God's deliberate plan for that to happen. But Peter also pulls no punches. He points the finger directly at the people that he's speaking to, highlighting their part in the death of Jesus, as we see in verse 23. Some of those in this crowd were surely also in Jerusalem for the Passover and were in the crowds that called for Jesus to be crucified and witnessed and mocked him as he was crucified. 
But the story doesn't end with Jesus' crucifixion, does it? Verse 24, God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And Peter again points to the Old Testament to show that this too was promised to happen in verses 25 down to verse 36. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You fill me with with joy in your presence. That's Psalm 16. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he would not abandon to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Messiah. Peter shows them that this psalm is not simply about David, but rather David spoke as a prophet of the one who he knew had been promised, the true king and Messiah, the one who would sit on his throne forever. That one is Jesus. He has come, he has died, he has risen, he's been witnessed by them. He has ascended to heaven and has now poured out the spirit which is responsible for what they are seeing and hearing. With all of this said by Peter, this passage now clearly presents a problem for the people listening and a potential problem for us as well. The Lord Jesus will now remain in heaven until God's enemies are defeated on the judgment day. Peter says that too in the passage. The Lord Jesus is the one who has been given the Holy Spirit and the people killed him. They have no hope of receiving the life given by the Holy Spirit The presence of God come to dwell in and with his people in a new, never before, previously unimaginable way. They will not receive that because the Holy Spirit has been poured out by Jesus, the one that they killed and crucified. And the Lord Jesus has not only been entrusted with the Holy Spirit, but entrusted with enacting God's judgment when the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. The people to whom Peter was speaking stand guilty before the Lord Jesus, before God. They crucified the Lord and Messiah, Jesus. And this passage presents a potential problem for us too, even if we were not directly involved in the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. Without Jesus, we too stand guilty before the Lord. We have broken his perfect law. We've gone against his perfect character. We have not worshipped him and loved him as he deserves. We have not treated our neighbor as we should. We're corrupted broken, afflicted by sin in our very nature, even from birth. Jesus has been entrusted with the Holy Spirit and with carrying out God's judgment. Without him, without Jesus, there is no hope of us receiving God's life-giving spirit, no hope of us receiving forgiveness, no hope of us standing when the great day of judgment comes. The people Peter preached to were affected by this message. See their response in verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? What about you? How are you affected by this message? Have you heard this message? Have you felt the weight of this message, the truth of this message? If you have, like the people, then there is hope. There is good news that we see in verses 38 to 41. And of course, the good news starts way back in verse 21. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then verse 38, Peter's response to the people, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord will call. With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. The answer, the hope 
is found in repenting and turning to Jesus, in finding forgiveness, in finding salvation in him. It's found in calling on the name of the Lord and being saved, in receiving the Holy Spirit when we do that, and then being baptized in obedience to the risen Lord Jesus. This is the promise of Pentecost. This is the promise of the gospel, that we can turn to the Lord Jesus and be saved, that we can call on his name and be saved. We, of course, may not be Jewish like the people who Peter was preaching to, but Peter shows even here how far this promise goes. He says it's open to these people, to their children, and it's open to all who are far off. These words, along with the miraculous tongues that are being spoken, show that there is now no boundaries to those who can call on the name of the Lord and be saved. Anyone can call on the name of the Lord and be saved. Pentecost shows us that God's presence is no longer mediated through ceremonial systems and through the nation of Israel. Rather, it's mediated through the Lord Jesus, who died and rose and ascended and pours out his Holy Spirit on his people. Anyone can repent of their sins, be saved, be forgiven, and receive all the promises of the gospel. Will you repent of your sins and find forgiveness? Will you call on the name of the Lord and be saved? be saved from death and hell, and instead find hope, life, relationship with God. This is what Pentecost is all about. This is what we should focus on. Of course, Pentecost is about the Holy Spirit being poured out on the church, about, being, about the Holy Spirit being poured out on God's people. But notice how even in this passage, the focus is on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the focus is on. The signs at Pentecost were just that, a sign that the last days had become that the day of salvation in the Lord Jesus offered to all without exception had now come. And as we draw to a close, there are just two things that I want to draw our attention to, uh, especially about the promise of Pentecost. There are two aspects to what is promised at Pentecost, which come in and through Jesus and through the Holy Spirit. The first thing that's promised at Pentecost is protection. Protection. Pentecost came in the context of approaching judgment. There's a clear need in Peter's message, isn't there? As Peter is preaching, he's telling them about the great and the glorious day of the Lord. He's telling them about approaching judgment. He's telling them that they need to call on the name of the Lord and be saved. He's telling them about the need for repentance and faith if they are to find forgiveness. This is the need to find protection from judgment. This can happen because of the reason for Jesus' death. We can find protection because of why and what happened when Jesus died, what happened in the, uh, on the cross and in the tomb and at his resurrection. This can happen. We can find protection because on the cross, Jesus took upon himself the punishment that the sins of those who believe in him deserve. As Jesus died, he died the death which our sins deserve. And when he rose from the dead, he broke the power of death, again, for all who believe in him. Sin is a transgression of the commandments of a perfect and holy God. Sin is a, a violation of his character, a rejection of his character and he himself. Sin invokes God's righteous and perfect wrath. It brings judgment. And sin also results in death. The Apostle Paul says, for the wages of sin is death. Jesus bore these punishments in himself, on himself, so that those who trust in him, so that those who call on his name will be protected, facing no punishment, no judgment, because it fell upon him on the cross, knowing eternal life because he defeated death. The promise is of redemption, forgiveness, protection from judgment. And yet the promise of Pentecost goes so much further than that, not just protection, but also God's presence. Pentecost promises not just protection, but God's very presence. This is what is so new and so radical about Pentecost. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, God himself, the third person of the Trinity, comes to dwell not just with those who believe in Jesus, but in them. Again, this is radical and shocking compared to God's dwelling place in the Old Testament. God could now literally not get closer to his people than he does as he comes in his Holy Spirit to dwell within them within us. Jesus promised that he'd be with his disciples even to the end of the age. 
and now his Holy Spirit dwells in them and in us too if we believe. God's Holy Spirit, Pentecost promises, will come and dwell in all those who believe, comforting, assuring, assuring that we are God's children, assuring that we belong to him, assuring that we are saved, convicting us of our sins, sealing us, keeping us safe until that great and glorious day of the Lord when we will be with him for all eternity. So this is what our attention should be on when we come to Pentecost. We could, of course, spend uh, a long time debating the different gifts and signs associated with Pentecost and the Holy Spirit. But that's not what Peter talks about on Pentecost, is it? He talks about the Lord Jesus, how he has been entrusted with the Holy Spirit, how through Jesus we can know protection from judgment and know the promise of God's presence with us and in us forevermore. Let's pray.